Hello everyone, welcome back to the HETCP channel. This is another video brought to you by the HETCP of CSCI 201. And today we're talking about networking in Java. And the objective for today is to build a very, very simple chat application, which involves a client and a server. As you can see here, I have two IDEs opened up. The one on the left is IntelliJ, and IntelliJ will be responsible for writing the client and then on the right side, we have Eclipse and we'll be running the server code in Eclipse. You may also have noticed that they are actually different projects. So this client is its own project and the server is, you know, its own project. I, I'm doing this just to show you that networking in Java involves two unrelated applications following the same set of rules over the network. The only way they communicate is over the network. A lot of people get confused because in class, we usually have server, the server and the client in one project, and people think that they somehow can share variables, but that is not the case. The only way the client and the server can communicate is over the network, over the socket, and I'll show you how in just a moment. This is going to be a multi-part video. I haven't decided how many parts yet, but in this first part, we'll just write a very, very simple application where a client can connect to a server and then send messages to a server and the server can send messages back. A very, very simple chat application uh, without multi-threading, without serialization, we'll deal with that in a later video. I really want to show you how networking works and I'll explain to you every single line what they mean so um, you know you really get this before the final. So without further ado, let's, let's jump into it. So we can either write the client first or the server first. I'll choose to write the client first. Uh, the choice is, uh, it doesn't matter what you choose. You can skip over to the server part if you want to see uh, how I wrote the server if you prefer uh, writing the server first, it doesn't matter. But uh, you know, in this video, I'll, I'll just write the client first. Now in order for a client to connect to a server in Java or the network, we have to use something called a socket. You can think of a socket as some kind of information tunnel. The client is at one end of the tunnel and then the server is on the other end so they can talk, they can exchange information. We're also gonna use print writer and buffer reader in this example, we're gonna change that up later, but because for now we're only writing strings so we can just use buffer reader and uh, print writers. We're also gonna use a scanner for inputs. So, uh, Let's write our first line of code. Let's first declare a socket, a print writer, buffer reader, and scanner. You see IntelliJ imports it for me, which is very nice. Okay. In order for a client to connect to a server, the client needs to know the server's host name and the port number. This is a little bit confusing, so I'll come up with a killer analogy once more. Let's say you're having a vacation in downtown LA at the USC hotel. I don't know why you want to do that, but uh, that's, what you're do that's what we're doing. So you can think of local host as uh, Figaro Street. It tells, it tells your program what street your target application is on. And you can think of the port number as a street number. So on that one street, you have all those buildings, all those applications running on the server's computer. You got to tell your client which application you want it to connect to. So that would be the street number of the USC hotel. And in this case, let's hard code, because we're running both of these locally, uh, we know that the, uh, the host name is localhost, and let's just define a port name. So here we go. S equals new socket, localhost, and then the port name, let's call it, hmm, 9999, there we go. You can see there's a red underline. So it throws some exceptions, let's add it to the, let's, Use a try catch instead. For now, I'll just catch. Okay, I think it throws an IO exception. And another thing I want to stress uh, when you're debugging, always do print stack trace. Don't do get message because get message doesn't tell you where the error occurred. 
and it just tells you like you have like an IO exception and when you're working with networks you'll have a lot of those and when when you do get message it just tells you you have an IO exception but you don't know where the IO exception is happening so uh, just do it for production maybe make it you know more user friendly but even then e.get message still doesn't generate anything user friendly so just to always do e.print stack trace for the purposes of this class so now we have our socket set up we're connecting to localhost which is this this computer on the port 9999 so we'll, we'll have to keep that in mind so later when we're running the server we gotta run the server on also on port 9999 and the next thing we want to do, we can print out some logging. We can do system.out. Actually, I want the log to really pop. So I can do, instead of doing system.out, which prints out some normal looking text, I'll do system.air.println. So the text that uh, prints out is red. I'll do connected to localhost. You can see I'm just hard coding everything for now. Uh, you know, it doesn't really matter. You can, you can, you know, you can make those dynamic afterwards. That's up to you. And the next thing that we're going to do, once we're connected to the server, we want to get our means of communication. And in this case, input streams and output streams. And for this, for this video, we're using a print writer and a buffer reader. Now, a print writer and a buffer reader is basically a way to write things into the output stream. And that's a print writer or read information from the input stream, and that would be the buffer reader. And those are mainly used to read bytes or strings or that kind of stuff. They're, they cannot be used to read objects. I mean, they, they could, but they have to turn them into binary or bytes, and that's not very convenient. But for this video, we're just sending around strings, so this is fine. Let's just do pw equals new print writer, and it takes in a output stream, get output stream. And you can see that because we have our connection established with the server here with the socket, we can get the corresponding output and input stream. So uh, we're going to do the same thing for buffer reader. Buffer, uh, buffer reader, new input stream reader, and then that would be s socket input stream. Uh, all the all the, all these stuff you just have to memorize. Unfortunately, it's just the way it is. And the next thing that we want to do is we want to get a new scanner going so we can actually take user input. And here we go. Now, again, this is used for sending out strings. This is used for getting strings from the server when the server decides to send you something. And this is used to, uh, to capture user input, so whatever you type into the console. And next will be the main logic of our chat application. And I want to place it in the while true loop. So, you know, in generally, in generally in programming, you don't want something to be in the while true loop unless, you know, you have some condition to break it out of. But in this case, we just want chat application that goes on forever until we stop it manually. So this is fine. Now, of course, the first step is to get the user input by using scan.next line. What it does is that whatever you type into the console, you press enter and scanner captures whatever line you just typed, puts it into the string variable, I mean this line variable of type string, and now you're ready to, to use it. And the next thing that we can do is we want to send this message to the server. And how can we do that? As we said previously, the print writer is responsible for sending stuff over the network so we'll use just that it's very simple to use we just do pw.printline and we print that and make sure we flush it now why do we flush for performance considerations you know every time so every time you type something let's say you're working on some essay I mean, a lot of you have had this happen to you before where you're, you know, you're before the ages of, you know, Google Docs and Google's, Google Cloud Suites. And, you know, you're typing your essay on Word and suddenly your computer crashes or Word crashes and everything that you didn't save were lost. Now, why does that happen? Because 
Word only saves things to the disk when you explicitly save. I mean, in later versions, they have auto save and this and that. But th the point is, every time it doesn't save every time you press a letter. It saves uh, based on some time interval, or you know, every or every how many letters or every how many lines. It's the same idea here. And wh why does it do that? So it does that to improve performance because memory is faster than disk. So by saving whatever you've been typing into the memory temporarily, it improves performance. It only saves whatever you typed onto the disk when you explicitly tell it to by doing Control or Command S, or when your buffer reaches a certain size or you know whatever its whatever um, its conditionals are. And then it decides, okay, this buffer is getting big enough, let's save it to the disk. So that's what it's doing. It's flushing the buffer to the disk, but it doesn't do that all the time. It's the same thing with the Java program here. If you don't do pw.flush, only one line of you know information is just tiny in the in the scope of the buffer and everything. So it's not gonna flush it out of performance considerations. And that's why if you don't have pw.flush, you might find that your messages are not getting out properly. Why? I mean, pw.println executed, but it hasn't been flushed. It's still being cached. So we got to do it explicitly to make sure that every single message that we type in, they're all sent to the server on time and, you know, properly. So there's that. And after we send our message, we expect to hear something back. So in order to do that, we can do a, oops, can create a new variable. We can call that uh, response, response line equals, and as we said before, we use buffer reader to read from the input stream, so that would just be buffer reader dot read line. Very simple. And now we can print, oops. Now we can print out whatever the server sends back to us. So to recap, String dot line, uh, sorry, scan dot next line captures the user input in the console and saves it into this line variable. PW dot print line writes the uh, whatever the user typed into the console into the output stream and flush makes sure that whatever that is in the output stream actually gets sent over to the to the other side. And br.read line reads an incoming message from the server, and then of course system.out.print line prints out whatever you know we receive. So now we have our chat client. It is fully functional. I mean, it is very very simple. It doesn't have multi-threading, and it can only receive a message. It can only do receive send receive send in order. But you know, it's a very very simple uh, chat client that demonstrates a lot of the networking concepts. So now that we're done with the chat client, we, we can, I mean, we can run it, but it's not going to do anything because we don't have anything on port 9999. So it's going to say connection refused. So in order to fix that, let's, let's write the server. Now let's come to the right side of the screen here on Eclipse. As we said earlier, the socket, what the socket does is that it looks for an application on some host at a specific port that is listening for incoming connections. Now the client is the one actively looking. So again, in the hotel analogy, you are the tourist and you're actively looking for that hotel. The hotel has to be there and, you know, of course the building has to be already there in order to welcome you into the hotel. So that's, what, that's exactly what a server socket does. A server socket is kind of like a receptionist. It doesn't try to connect to other people. What it does is that it waits for other people to come to it and then, you know, to establish a communication. So let's, let's do it. Let's use a server socket. It's called SS. Oops. Or yeah, it has a better idea. Equals new server socket. And we want to give it a port number. As we said earlier, the port number, the, the host name is like the street name and the port number is like a street number. So if you only have the street name, you still can't find that hotel because you don't know which number, what the street number is. And since we did 9999 on the client side, let's do the same thing on the server side. 
9999. And it's, it's complaining because uh, it throws some exceptions. So let's, let's fix that. Yep, there we go. And we can we can print a uh, diagnostic message saying that, you know, server started at port, port 999. I'm not sure what was happening. All right. So now that we've started the server, you know, we have our, you know, front desk set up. We need an actual receptionist at the front desk because, you know, whenever you walk into a hotel, you always see someone welcoming you at the front desk. You don't just see a desk with no, 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 no person in it. So, um, so now we got to make our receptionist and that's actually another socket. And I'll explain why in a bit. Oh. Oh, service lock. I name it differently. There we go. Okay. So what is happening here? So again, on this line, we're hosting our application on port 9999. And what we're doing here is that we're actively listening for any attempts, any incoming connections. And we're basically, and the server socket is accepting those incoming requests and then wrapping it into a socket so that we can use it. So we can get the corresponding input streams and output streams from it so we can properly communicate with whoever is, is trying to connect to us. So, that, that, so that's what it does. And we can print out something saying, oh, I can't see today. Connection accepted from so what this does is that it gets the IP address of the incoming request so that you know it's gonna say like 0.0, .0 or whatever because we're doing it locally but it's just to show that you know we've accepted an incoming connection the server program is actually gonna pause here to wait for any incoming connections and it's not going to proceed this line won't get printed until a connection has been made so with that out of the way and because you know we're using print writers and buffer readers for our client we want to match that for our server so let's do that we can honestly we can just copy and paste this because uh, same we got it to click to print writer pw Reader. There we go. And hmm, let's see. Oh yeah, because I named it differently. There we go. I have to import that too. All right, we got this. Okay. So now that we've established, we've accepted a, an incoming connection from the client, and we've also acquired the appropriate input and output streams. Now, what we're gonna do is that we're gonna start chatting. Oh, and also we need a scanner here too, because uh, in this example, we actually want, to want the server and the client to talk to each other. I mean, to, to type. Scanner. Send that in. There we go. Another while true loop, just like whatever is over here. So, as you can see here, because the client sent something over first, you know, it might be a better idea to receive it first. Response line equals. B where is it? BR, BR dot B line. And then afterwards, we can do the same thing. Got to print it. Response line. And then let's do a, uh, let's get some user input. And again, we can. 
can write it, print it to the output stream. And then, of course, remember to flush. All right. So now we have everything going for us. You know, it complains that it's never closed, but you know, you can close it in a finally block. You know, if you really want to close it, but I'm not going to do this for this video. So, okay. Let's run it. And keep in mind that you, you, you have to run the server first before you can run the client. Otherwise, it's just going to throw an error. You see, connection refused because you never had any, the hotel's not there. You try to look for it at street localhost, street number 9999, but there's nothing there. So you got to build a hotel first. So let's run this. All right, servers, you see it's red because I used the error stream. So it makes it really, really easy to see. I, don't know, I kind of like it. So now let's run the client again. See, connect it. And then it says connection accepted. There we go. And now we can start chatting. Actually, before we start chatting, let's, let's end this. Uh, I want to make it so that we know who's talking to who. So let's add a prefix here. Client. And let's add another one. Server. There we go. Let's rerun these, just so that it's more clear who's who's doing the talking. All right. So the server's going to be waiting for the client to type something. Hello, server. And indeed, it shows up. And keep in mind, again, these are two completely separate projects. If you look at if you look at this, they're they're not the same project. They're they're running they're all they're running on different computers. You can think of them like that. So the only communication that's going on again to stress this is over over the network via the socket. That's the only way they can ever know, uh, ever learn of each other's existence, and you know they can only share data. That's the only data that's being shared is the ones who are explicitly passing over the sockets nothing else no shared variables nothing so you know we can you know we can chat away uh you know i, I love talking to myself um yeah there we go <clears throat> yep so uh so that's about it for this uh for this first video it's a very very simple one and in the next video i'm probably gonna go over uh let's see i'm I'm gonna go over serialization first, so how you can send objects instead of strings, because you know in in the homework four, as you may have noticed, strings have its own limitations. So you know, if if let's say if, let's say a client sends a server uh, Jeff, okay, the string Jeff. How do you know like what is Jeff? I mean, I know who Jeff is, but who what is Jeff, right? Is Jeff a username? Is is Jeff a password? Is Jeff you know? The client trying to guess like the word or you know what is it right a string itself is rather limited and you know you can add digits you can add whatever special characters at the beginning to you know and you can check it on the server side by splitting strings but to me that's just a really hacky way of doing things and you know it, it has its limitations you know some people said uh, they can you know number they can append like a digit or whatever to the beginning of the string to identify what the string is for but but the issue is what if you know what, what if something else you know kind of messes it up it's kind of it's easy to break and you know it's not a good practice so in the next video i'll show you how to send over entire objects of the network and you know all that also covers a little bit about serialization how that works thanks for watching again I'll see you in the next video. Hesse P sign out.